Hey guys, and welcome back to Art Theory, the only place where I can make half-assed doodles and call it intellectual. Nintendo decided to drop a huge new trailer on us a few weeks ago and 10 minutes of gameplay, so we've finally got a little more to go off of. Thank Hylia, because you can only decipher glowing green squiggles for so long. This is the third installment in my Tears of the Kingdom changes to the main races series. If you haven't seen my first two, definitely go check that out especially now that we've gotten a new trailer from the most recent Direct. If you ask me, some of the clips in there absolutely proved some of my thoughts and theories. Oh, and as a side note, my content going forward will not be using any leaks or spoilers. My channel will continue to be based off of material that Nintendo has published, and the occasional rumor. I ask everyone to be respectful of individuals who don't want spoilers in the comment section. Thanks for your consideration, everyone. Now let's get into this. Besides the ominous clips of Death Mountain, the Heba region is probably the most frequent area we've seen in the trailers and promotional art. At first, I thought this giant cyclone was surrounding Rito Village, but the newest trailer gives us a clearer view. Heba Peak seems to be the actual source of the bad weather. What's causing this hurricane, and what's happening to the Rito and their village because of this? That's what we'll be discussing in today's art theory. The Rito are an avian group who take pride in their ability of flight. In Breath of the Wild, you can often find the Rito people exploring the different areas of Hyrule. They prefer their cold Heber climate though, as their feathers help keep them warm and insulated. A lot of their textiles and designs seem to be inspired by the Andean people of the Central Andes of South America. Going as far back as Wind Waker, the music of Dragon Roost Island contains traditional Andean instruments of the Zamponia, which is a type of pan flute, and the Sharongo. I'll be pulling some inspiration from the Andean culture and, of course, the Zelda series in general to help design our Tears of the Kingdom Rito warriors. First thing I'd like to address is this terrible weather they seem to be having, which, going off of Breath of the Wild, will probably start when Link is climbing halfway up a really tall mountain. In many of the Hyrule surface clips we've gotten, it seems to be dark, dreary, and lightning everywhere. This is especially a problem for our feathered friends who fly high in the sky and are at a huge risk of being struck down. For this reason, we'll be exchanging their leather body armor for a new rubber suit. Luckily, we have a great example of this in Breath of the Wild. The rubber armor set grants Link shock resistance, but if upgraded a few times, will make the wearer invulnerable to all lightning strikes. The in-game description reads, This armor has built-in electricity resistance thanks to its source material, an ancient marvel called rubber. Such technology does not exist in this modern age. The Zonai technology and devices also don't exist in the modern age, but all of a sudden their materials seem to be everywhere. So let's bring back the rubber technology for the Rito's tunics. I designed it heavily after Link's rubber chest piece, making it style to the Rito's physique better and also adding the Rito symbol in yellow to the chest. I still want the colorful fabrics and patterns from the Rito's original outfits to be present, so I added a layer of Andean-inspired fabric underneath the rubber armor. I kept this pattern in the frequent red, tan, and green colors common in Rito designs. This long tunic sticks out from the bottom of the rubber armor and will also help keep them warm in the cold Hebra skies. Going back to the rubber armor, I'm replacing the calf and talon wrap with something similar to the rubber boots. I don't want to obstruct their talons or inhibit their flight, so I'm staying in line with the rubber boots but making it fit the Rito form much better. Now, let's get into the part of this design which I'm convinced will explode the comment section. But first, it's time for my obligatory begging for subs. If you're new here or haven't yet, please consider subscribing. My channel is small, but we're growing fast, and I think it would be amazing if we hit 1k subscribers before the release of Tears of the Kingdom. My content can also mimic the look of the recent Tears of the Kingdom art book leaks, and some of the content I've already put out has already been mistakenly flagged. So I would especially appreciate it if you could interact with this video and share it with a fellow Zelda nerd, so it doesn't get suppressed. Thanks so much, and let's get back to the video. The mighty wings of the Rito aren't going to cut it for the challenges the Rito will face in Tears of the Kingdom. They're going to need some technological advancements if they're to navigate the horrible storms in their region. Besides their famed champion Rivali, the Rito don't actually have the ability to ascend into the sky. They rely on gliding and the wind to guide their flying. They are at the mercy of the winds and the swirling storm around them. With a ferocious hurricane only feet away from their doorstep, if they plan on being able to ascend to the sky or fly in the direction they want, they will need some assistance. Am I adding more wings to the creatures who already have wings? Yes, yes I am. It actually fits the theme of the new transportation creation we've seen in the trailers. It would be really interesting to see Link aid in the design of these powered wings. I imagine we could meet a new engineer near Rito Village. Maybe they're a Rito who has been traveling all over Hyrule and beyond and has been fascinated with Darner bugs. 
Darner bugs in Breath of the Wild resemble closely to dragonflies in the real world. Dragonflies are the real-life masters of the sky. They're incredibly different from any flying animal as they have four independent wings. These wings allow the dragonfly to accelerate, change trajectory on a dime, hover, and go in any direction they want rather than just forward. Maybe the scientist has been studying the Darner for quite some time and has come up with a schematic of how this extra pair of wings could work. They might just need a bit of help to finish gathering the materials. We've already seen Link gathering parts to make vehicles in the trailers and the gameplay. It would be an awesome part of the main quest to help the engineer gather these fallen Zonai materials and finish making the Rito warrior's wings. Pura or Robbie could also be the engineer helping the Rito, but I'd personally prefer to meet some new characters. Either way, creating these wings to aid the Rito in their flight with a fetch quest would be an amazing introduction to the Hebra area. Quite honestly, considering how the Rito evolved from the Zora of Ocarina Time into the Rito of Wind Waker in such a short time span, I wouldn't be completely shocked if these wings grew in the time it takes Zelda to get a haircut. But mixing some Zonai tech into their design would be a lot more believable and super cool to see. I've used the propellers that we've seen on the Zonai vehicles already, some of that weird glue, and more Andean fabrics and Rito colors. I've included a harness made of leather to hold the wing attachment. I also added a power source for the wings inspired by the land vehicle from the trailer, but we'll see that a bit later. Lastly, I changed up their long braids on the side of their heads to mimic the style of Andean Chulu hats. These appendages are very similar, but the Breath of the Wild Rito has a braid with a decorative anchor-like object at the end. Staying true to the Chulu design, I've replaced the anchor with more of a pom-pom. Finishing up our Rito warrior, I've added in the same Rito weapons and shield from Breath of the Wild, as I don't think these will change much. Hopefully, we'll get to see more additions in the real game, though. While working on this video, we got the 10 minutes of gameplay with producer Eiji Anuma, so I feel I need to make a couple changes to the weapons in order to make it more accurate. There. Much better. Enjoy fusing, friends. Unlike the other towns in Breath of the Wild, Rito Village didn't have life-threatening circumstances caused by the rampaging Divine Beast. The Zora had flooding and the possibility of the dam breaking, the Gorons had molten rocks cascading from the sky, and the Gerudu had a risk of a sandstorm wiping out their entire town, while the Rito, I guess, had some loud screeching to deal with? Rito Village was one of the most unique town and architecture designs I've ever seen in a game, with their tall pillar and hanging cage homes. Quite frankly, it was an absolute pity that their gameplay and storyline felt so limited in comparison to their designs. I would love for Tears of the Kingdom to take their storytelling to a new level and for that improvement to be represented in the landscape. Also, this is just a completely personal side note, but can we just take a second and appreciate how the pine needles function in the water? I know, I know, this is way too specific, but whenever I replay Breath of the Wild and get to Rito Village, I always hop in the water to swim around a bit, just to see how the needles propel away from Link. The physics in this game are just mwah, perfection. Starting off our sketch here, we're getting all the island shapes down, which I don't have any reason to believe would change. Then we have the main structure in which Rito Village is built upon. This is a very large and precarious rock formation that acts as a roosting station for the divine beast Vameto. We've seen no indication that the Divine Beasts will reprise their roles in Tears of the Kingdom, so what will the purpose of the Roosting Pillar be now? I believe it will be another way to symbolize the hardships befalling the different regions and its people. The top of the pillar will break off and topple over. If we look at the new trailer, we get the scene of Heber Peak barely illuminated by lightning. In the small glimpses, we can see the iconic pillar doesn't seem to be present. I tried to line up this shot with my save file and got the camera angle as close as I could. As you can see, the Rito Pillar still protrudes past the mountain range in the horizon in Breath of the Wild. But the most recent trailer tells a different story. The Pillar of Rito Village is a point of pride for the Rito, and it seems fitting to disrupt it. I also noticed from some angles the Pillar created a little heart shape, which is why I chose to break the rock formation there, further driving home this theme of heartbreak and destruction. Now, what could have toppled such a strong rock formation? There's a couple things I think could do this. A giant lightning strike could have caused it, some strong flying enemies, powerful winds from the hurricane on Heber Peak, or possibly Vaughn Meadow took a souvenir for the road. The huge storm on the peak will not be confined to the mountain range. I see the hurricane functioning very similarly to the Thunderhead from Skyward Sword, an enclosed dome of wind that you can enter at a very specific spot. But from the outside, tornadoes would be shooting out of the cyclone, scarring the landscape as it goes. When you fly towards the Thunderhead and Skyward Sword, tornadoes shoot out from the dome to inhibit the player. This is one of the few things from Skyward Sword I'd like to see brought back. No, not you. 
No, no, no. <laughs> you go back to your hole. Okay. Phew. Okay, good. Between the lightning and the tornadoes, we can change up the landscape even more. I've also destroyed a lot of the trees surrounding the town. Some will be knocked over, others completely derooted. The crater of the water underneath the village will contain a lot more debris and trees, maybe even the destroyed top of the pillar, all caused by the turbulent weather nearby. Moving on to the architecture, the Rito live in fairly minimalistic wooden cages that hang from the town pillar. These homes are very susceptible to bad weather. Because of this, these cages will be boarded up. I also believe that the new flying beasts will be a frequent enemy of the Rito in Tears of the Kingdom. So having extra precautions to stop these enemies from invading is probably wise. We're adding in strong solid sheets to the once open windows, painted in, you guessed it, Andean patterns and Rito colors. I added in a few more crooked boards as I imagine they will be hastily adding more strength to these windows whenever the hurricane damages their homes. There's not too much more we can add without completely changing the Rito's architecture. But the single chain keeping their homes hanging isn't going to cut it anymore. A small addition would be a second hook to the base of the building to help keep their homes from shaking too much in the harsh winds. They could even add a few more chains off the side to help suspend the structures. To truly give Rito Village a new experience, it has to feel bleak. The Rito aren't carelessly flying around in the sun and singing tunes. They are boarded into their homes. Their town pillar no longer towers above the rest, but instead can be found in pieces at the bottom of the lake. Stormy atmosphere will cast a gray cloud over the Heber region, only to be cleared if the source of the cyclone is defeated. Now let's move on to the main origin of all this chaos, Heber Peak's boss. From what we've seen so far, we're getting a lot of new enemies, but we're also getting old enemies brought back. Last month's trailer showed us a glimpse of Gleok, a three-headed dragon that has appeared in three other Zelda games. We have seen petty Zelda enemies reprising their roles like the Rio Dead, but it was refreshing to see Gleok, who's often a boss or mini boss fight. I'd like to keep this theme going and bring back another boss from the Zelda series. This boss will be deep inside the cyclone on Heber Peak, so it's only fitting that they suit their surroundings. I narrowed down the extensive list of Zelda bosses over the years to be wind or lightning related. A lot of Zelda bosses could make sense here, but one that I think would be most unique and practical is Cyclock from Phantom Hourglass. Cyclock is a gigantic flying Octorok who controls the winds. Cyclock could have easily created the gigantic cyclone above Heber Peak, which could also make sense as to why it doesn't seem to be naturally occurring and doesn't seem to be present for the whole game. Cyclock also fights by sending out smaller vortexes to attack the player, which would fit well with our theory of tornadoes terrorizing Rito Village. I designed this iteration of Cyclock after the original boss and the snowy biome Octorok from Breath of the Wild. As Octoroks attempt to blend in, this pale colder tone cameo makes the most sense for the top of Heber Peak. Instead of a sprout on its skull, I opted for the original Cyclops shell. The original boss honestly looks a bit silly and comical, as do a lot of enemies from the chibi cartoon style Zelda games. I really want this Cyclops to look more intimidating. They'll have a furrowed brow and even longer limbs than the Octorok from Breath of the Wild. Its scale will be massive, to justify the huge cyclone it creates. I imagine this fight will play out somewhat similarly to the infected Levios in Skyward Sword, with Link flying around, trying to hit Cyclock where it hurts the most. In some of the scenes of Heber Peak we've seen without the bad weather, it seems there is a cluster of floating islands. Link will have the option of aerial fighting with a bow, which we know will be extensive in this game considering the patents Nintendo has filed. Or you could land on one of the many islands engulfed by the wind and shoot or slice from there. The player will have to avoid many tornadoes and huge tentacles hurling at you. In Phantom Hourglass, where we first meet Cyclops, you defeat it by using their own winds against them, by placing bombs that float up, knocking the beast down. It would be such an epic fight to have a similar mechanic. Once one of Cyclops' winds returns to them, the bomb explodes, knocking Cyclops to one of the islands below for Link to attack. Eventually, after a few rounds with the Hebra's monster, the cyclone dissipates and Rito Village is saved. One other theory I have around Cyclops being the boss is the reward we might get. In the most recent trailer, we get a shot of what seems to be a hot air balloon. But without the hot air? This device seems to be in line with some of the other methods of transportation we've seen, but looks very different in design. It's not the Zonai teal color we've seen, and it doesn't seem to have a power source, nor the wind propellers. In Breath of the Wild, when you defeat an Octorok, it drops a few different items. One of those being Octo Balloons. Octo Balloons are very unique in their function. You are able to use these balloons by dropping them on an object, and if it has enough power, will inflate and start to float the object it's attached to. I think it would be so cool to defeat Cyclops and get a giant Octo Balloon. 
This can be quickly fashioned by the player or maybe our new engineer friend to craft a new flying vehicle to take us higher into the sky islands than we have been before. Especially if this means that the Octo Balloon inflates and powers itself, since we've already seen how fast these things run out of juice when trying to carry Link into the air. So there we have it, from our new four-winged rubber Rito design to the devastated and hastily protected Rito Village, all because of the recreated Cyclock boss terrorizing Hebra Peak. What do you guys think? What do you want to be true of this theory, and what would you change about the Hebra region and its inhabitants? Let me know in the comments down below. I'm about to start on the final illustration, but please consider subscribing and sharing this with a friend. It really helps a small channel out. All right, let's finish this bird brain theory. Unfortunately, I lost a lot of my sketching process during this, but I didn't want to have to redo it and make you guys wait even longer for another video. I also have been terribly sick for over a month, so that's part of the wait time. I'm planning on finishing up this four-part series before the release of Tears of the Kingdom, so stick with me, people. Anyway, working on this illustration, I wanted to capture the dark and stormy themes we've seen surrounding Heber Peak. The destroyed Rito Village is in the foreground, with Heber Peak encompassed by winds in the distance. This was a great opportunity to show the scale of Cyclock. I drew its tentacles breaching the sides of the Cyclone, reaching out menacingly. I utilized the lightning to give it a slight silhouette inside the Cyclone. For our Rito warrior, I'm drawing him from the back, which gives us an alternate view of our original design. Most will be the same, but now we can see the power source for the new set of wings. I stole this glowing battery from the shot of the train vehicle from the trailer. I can't be sure that this is the power source, but it certainly seemed like it. I worked in a similar design and included it on the harness. I envision a Rito warrior, or even maybe Teba, helping us with the new wings to ascend into the sky. Getting high and close enough to enter through the top of the cyclone, dropping down into the eye of the storm, where we will face off against Hebra's unwelcome tenant. I added in some of those tornadoes, similar to the Skyward Sword ones, and some of the new flying enemies we've seen in the sky. And of course, lots of lightning. There we have it, our final illustration. I really can't wait to re-explore the Hebra region in Tears of the Kingdom, and I hope listening to me ramble on about my theories and designs have gotten you excited too. Definitely let me know what you think about my theory in the comments down below. Thanks for watching everyone, and I'll see you next time.